Okay, I'm going to make this the 12th and last video in this series. I'm really just going to try to paraphrase and summarize what else is remaining here rather than just reading the full text, even though I think the full text is worth a read. Again, this is a reaction commentary to Superhuman in the Octagon and Perfect in the Courtroom, assessing the culpability of martial artists who killed during street fights. So basically, let me tell you what they want us to do first if you read the rest of the article. They want to make it mandatory that big organizations like the UFC and martial arts instructors in general, that we all have basic self-defense legal training. So that if you want to be considered a martial arts instructor, you have to know some basics about self-defense law. They want people to consider whether or not a martial art is deemed practical for self-defense in deciding whether or not we're going to hold, what type of legal standards we're going to hold martial artists in Two, when it comes to defending themselves. And when it comes to applying the martial sufficiency test, they, they basically want to look at the person as an individual and see if they've had the training, if, they're, if their style makes it so that they should be able to act responsibly. If they've had any real world experience that also would support the fact that, yeah, they ought to know how to act under pressure. If the instructor gave them the training and by the time and they should have already learned from the instructor, yeah, how to use this stuff in the real world, then they're pretty much just like a gun. It's like they're armed because they have skills that the average person does not have. Now, this is applying the martial arts efficiency test. They're talking about the situation with Torre at the beginning of the article, okay? People versus Torre. They say Torrey would have been found martially sufficient and been denied the imperfect self-defense and provocation defenses because they said he saw the attack coming and he already disarmed the guy and he choked him for several minutes. So under martial sufficiency, he's already liable right there, right? They say MMA teaches you to deal with one-on-one -on -one conflict. It doesn't teach you how to disarm people but that the quick reactions are a byproduct of MMA training that he used. And since he actually pulled it off without being injured, there was no more imminent threat. Remember, imminent means right away. And it says he was apparently taught the rear naked choke, but no evidence exists to show that he was taught to choke correctly, which is fine. But where is it, where is it right here? Oh, here it is. This is how they got him. They said, so even if you want to nullify his martial arts training, which the internet would definitely lead you to do, it comes down to this third point here. Third, Torrey seems to have the proficiency to apply his training in a self-defense scenario. He had served as a bouncer and presumably had applied his skills before in real self-defense scenarios. So that means that even if he didn't get training, in the dojo, he had real world training as a bouncer, so he should have known better. Fourth, Torre was not prevented from using his skills by a handicap. He was good before and after the attack, and presumably during, and he held the choke for several minutes. Chokes can be rendered, can be, since chokes can be released and still render the victim unconscious, Torre's use of the choke for several minutes shows his intent to kill Richards with that technique which I would agree, and it was a situation that somebody told me about that took place over a decade ago now where somebody did the same thing. He held a real, and this was not a MMA person, this was a military person, held on a rear naked choke on somebody for about 30 minutes, so yeah, that dude went to jail. Just did that. So, it said, like I said in the other videos, they're not saying if you've taken a karate class, you're automatically a killing machine. They basically want to say that if you, basically, if you know better, you're supposed to show better. So the legislative changes they're recommending, the legislative changes that they're recommending are martial artists, martial arts instructors to be knowledgeable about self-defense basics, including the elements, of attack and response, okay? They're talking about self-defense law. Martial arts institutions should be required to certify their instructors know some self-defense law. 
I think that's coming, and I think we're all going to have to deal with it. All martial arts institutions should include in their curriculum the responsibilities of fighters inside and outside of the competition setting. This idea expands on a philosophy of traditional martial arts with modernized roles and responsibilities to defend current self-defense scenarios. And they think that this will reduce excessive violence by all martial artists, no matter the specialty. So please watch these videos like this. They say the martial arts community must adapt to current legal standards. The martial arts community must teach its practitioners to fight within the rules of the law. The martial arts evolved on basic battle for the sport and unconstrained street environments, but they don't care. This backdrop, it, against this backdrop, it will behoove the next generation of martial arts, particularly those who teach self-defense to civilians to refocus their methodology away from continuing to attack the aggressor once they're legally down and out. Incorporating an applicant Incorporating and applied self-defense law into martial arts lessons will help prevent, protect students and teachers of the martial arts physically and legally. Just as fighters learn that certain techniques are forbidden in the octagon, they must learn that there are rules on the street, legal rules such as disproportionate response to force that forbid certain actions. Take into account the number of opponents. Okay, so that's the type of stuff that I am doing my best to address. Listen to this. Bogan reminds us that the problem of so many self-defense systems is that martial artists are taught to finish the person even when he is down and out. That is where the law goes against us. Can't do that. The way we do one steps, block, punch, throw, one hit, I think that keeps you safe legally. If you're a lawyer, let me know if I'm wrong. Because martial arts are trained to injure, crook, kip, or even kill another person when training drills are also for safety reasons, instructors must make their students aware of the difference between training and reality. And you know, I do my best to do that, but see, a lot of the students just don't want to hear it. They got their kung fu, super ninja, high you fantasies, man. And it's tough breaking through that fog. And if you don't go along with the Kung Fu Haya Super Ninja Fantasies, man, they gonna they may run somewhere else. I say fine, let them run, but you know, if you gotta keep the lights on, you may cater to their Kung Fu Super Ninja Fantasies, but be aware, it looks like the law is coming for us. Responsible martial artists, the reigning champs, they're talking about how they want champions to be role models in this section. And they talk about how some MMA guys stopped the robbery using non-lethal force because they all worked as a group and pinned down the robbers. Okay? So this is the conclusion. If a martial artist satisfies MST, then the court should deny him imperfect self-defense and provocation as a matter of law. So basically, like I keep saying, if you know better, you are supposed to show better. And they're going to try to look at your training and everything else in here and your ability to see whether or not you should know what you're doing. And this is him waxing poetic. Let's see. With the popularity of MMA bringing martial arts into the foreground of societies around the world, now is an appropriate time to address the issue of how to deal with undisciplined but highly skilled fighters before the problem gets out of hand. So basically, they're using negative perceptions and stereotypes of MMA to come after all of us. We're all going to be thrown under the same umbrella of well, the cage, the cage, right? They're going to try to tar all of us with the same brush and put these rules on us. Now, what I think the solution is, those of us who are doing this stuff, they gave some pretty good, reasonable suggestions. We have to teach restraint. We have to go back to teach the control. We want to have to put pressure on people at the same time, force them to remember that they have to control themselves, and we're going to have to model that behavior ourselves. It's not going to just be a, we can't go by the win, 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 win at all costs attitude scenario. We've got to really focus on self-defense and remind people that if you are a civilian, 
Your job is to protect yourself and defend yourself, not to go around killing people. You can't. You are not a cop. So this is my this is my last video on superhuman in the octagon, imperfect in the courtroom, and assessing the culpability of martial arts who killed during street fights. That legal comment is by Stephen Michael Ian Coonan. All of these videos in this series should have a link back to the original article. I highly recommend you go through, listen to these videos and read the original article and any ideas and comments you have are below and if you want a good place to get started go to gun forms and use of force forms for the gun and just substitute martial arts for gun work with that paradigm because i think that's what they're going to try to do with us so thanks for watching this video like comment and subscribe please share this with people who like to talk 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 about the martial arts as always thank you for your time and peace